Alright. So, looking at our calendar where we find ourselves. So, week 8 already. Um, this week, we've wrapped up the various disciplines, thin civil, and we've got a couple sort of general uh, engineering topics. So, today I'm talking about sustainability as it applies to engineering. Then we'll talk about licensure on Wednesday. Wednesday, all uh, the licensure probably will only be about an hour, and then I'll be introducing the, the final group project. We'll have new groups for that, so there will be plenty of opportunity to work um, after the lecture uh, on Wednesday if you want to do that. Next Wednesday, uh, the class is just a work session on that uh, final group project. And that final group project will take up the last week's class. We'll have presentations. You know, we'll only get through a handful of presentations uh, on Monday of the last week. We'll finish the presentations Wednesday, and then we'll take the rest of the bridges. So that's kind of where we're at as far as schedule and the term and topics. So this week you do have uh, some reading assigned. There will be a quiz this week. So that's kind of what's on the agenda for today. So sustainability, specifically as it applies to our engineering projects, our objectives define sustainability explain how it applies to engineering projects. Rooted in that discussion as far as sustainability is lifespans. So I want to be able to list the typical design lifespans for various infrastructure. And then one of the topics we'll be talking about is different material choices that we can influence uh, as engineers. Concrete being a big one. So explain two reasons why concrete contributes to climate change. And then we'll look at a few different rating systems that can be, uh, that have been built out of the idea of sustainability. And the latter one we'll be looking at is living building challenge. So discuss the goals of the living building challenge and the first project built to meet those goals with the bullet center. So, sustainability, it's a big buzzword, right? So, what does sustainability mean to you? What ideas or themes or topics come to mind with sustainability? Sure. Carbon footprint. So, rooted in uh, the, sort of the discussion there with climate change and so carbon footprint. Other ideas as far as what comes to mind with sustainability? Renewable energy. And so specifically that'd be uh, you know solar, wind, Tidal, uh, water, things of that nature, non-fossil fuel sources. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll put material choices, so recyclable materials, uh, maybe I'll put green materials that nature, sure. Other ideas? So how important do you think sustainability is for engineering and just for society as a whole? Is it something that's important or not so much? I saw some head shaking for important. So, so what makes it important? Yeah. 
Yeah, so so tied in there, some of the themes and ideas I heard you had was, uh, you know, uh, sort of using what we have, um, being responsible with our resources. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so being uh, thoughtful with our choices for energy, materials, etc. Investing. Mm hmm. Investing in um, sustainable practices. So, you know, we've talked some just about the evolution of sort of our human societies and the role that civil engineers specifically have played in that. You know, early human societies, um, you know, we didn't have a good solid foundation uh, of science and you know, health and implications for all that. Uh, and population was low, and so the, you know, the early sort of environmental movement where the wastes were more organic in nature really was just uh, sort of fundamental, just if we separate those organic wastes, get them out, uh, the volume wasn't that big, so uh, we could sort of deal with things that way. Once the uh, Industrial Revolution started and our ability to really produce uh, just a whole host of new materials, new substances, uh, and just on a scale unmanageable before, you know, the, the, our impacts and the effects of that uh, have really sort of changed. Um, and so all that sort of goes to the heart of this sustainability that, you know, in early human cultures, sustainability wasn't quite as much of a consideration, but as we've made advances in technology, made advances in healthcare, made advances with our infrastructure, giving people the resources that they can uh, live a healthier, longer, uh, more productive life, you know, all those impacts um, as far as the human built environment just skyrocket. So, similar to uh, the environmental movement, you know, that was really galvanized in sort of that 60s time frame when the problems were just so bad, you know, our lack of regulation on industrial systems, we couldn't neglect anymore. And so we had to sort of start to tackle those, regulate things, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, things of that nature that really um, uh, were huge improvements in our country uh, and have had a considerable uh, effect and positive change on our environment. You know, on the, the global stage, the idea of sustainability uh, came to the forefront there, and for the UN, the UN had a Brundtland Commission, and they used this language to define sustainability. Meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations. And so I think that sort of uh, perspective there as far as using our resources in balance, not affecting things, future generations or just pushing things out, you know, if we, if our way of living cannot be sustained by our children and our grandchildren, then inherently it seems like there's some problem of our way of living and that we should try and figure out a way that we can live that's sustainable, that people can practice year in, generation after generation, and be in balance with the earth. So there are lots of different perspectives we can use to sort of look at sustainability. You know, we've looked at some of these examples. Um, you know, the air pollution of LA got so so bad. You know, caused the implementation of some of the Clean Air Act policies, specifically catalytic converters that tackled a lot of that smog pollution, um, and in a short time span, you know, really had positive effects. You know, the polluted rivers and uh, Cuyahoga River, Willamette River, um, that 
the Clean Water Act and various permutations of that, uh, put that regulation in place to address the non-point point source uh, of those pollutants. It really has um, cleaned up our waterways a lot. So looking towards projects specifically, there's a triple bottom line perspective um, to look at things and how we can characterize sustainability. And that is for any sort of given project, you can kind of look at the people, the planet, and the profit. And so looking at the people that we're designing our project for, we can come up with hundreds of different solutions that would be prioritizing different uh, priorities for the people. Similarly for the planet, we can look at a hundred different options and solutions for uh, that project that would have positive effects for the planet. And then looking at the economics, you know, the profit, we can look at a hundred different options that uh, would make us money on that project. And the sustainable solution for that project would be the one that would find the balance between all three. Because if we prioritize only the people or only the planet or only the profit, you know, it's not a sustainable choice. And so we need to be able to afford it, uh, it needs to serve the people that we're ultimately building the project for, and it needs to be in balance with the planet. So our job as engineers, you know, often we've got many choices that we can choose from. And often, you know, when we're looking at choices, a big driver is uh, cost considerations. But sometimes the cost considerations to make a more sustainable choice is really not as significant as you might think it would be. Um, and so our role as engineers to, is to help our clients and the public to understand the nature of the choices and the nature of the cost and really kind of advocate and push for those with more sustainable choices. So I think it's also important with the sustainability discussion to recognize that the, or the world is not homogeneous. You know, we've got uh, a lot of different uh, resources that are used unequitably across the world. And so what this graph is that we're looking at here on this lower X graph, we've got something that's been uh, described as the human development. Index. So the idea is that uh, life expectancy, education and knowledge, uh, per capita income, that those various metrics have sort of been come together to come up with the Human Development Index. And the idea is that we would want to have at least a 0 0.8 uh, metric there that would be giving people adequate resources to live a healthy, high-functioning life. So ideally, we'd want everybody in the world to have that high quality of life. And then on the Y graph here, we've got the ecological footprint in hectares per person. So basically the, the resources per capita that are used by uh, those, those people. And then we've got you know, various continents, you know, countries here. So Africa is in yellow. Uh, you can see that most Africa is falling you know, well below the human development index. So their people don't have you know, a combination of life expectancy, access to knowledge, and per capita income to be able to provide resources for their families. And so we'd like to be able to raise them up. And the sustainable area we want the world to be in would be right here, where everyone's getting access to the uh, resources they need, but that they're only using resources uh, that are in balance with the world. And so no one in the world is in that sustainability quadrant. So here in the US, we're at a high human development index, but we're using a lot more resources than we should. So within the US, um, you know, we had the environmental movement, this idea of sustainability, passed a lot of regulation, uh, you know, we continue to uh, sort of build, you know, there started to be, get to be a need and a perspective that, hey, 
we're building things, but there's are the things that we're building still have negative impacts. And so what can we do to create a built environment that has fewer negative impacts? And one of the ways that we tackle this, you know, we're engineers, we like checklists, is that we came up with a lot of different rating systems depending on the type of project it was. So LEED, you're maybe familiar with, it's uh, one that gets, um, oh, I guess a, a decent amount of press. Um, and so LEED was focused on buildings and it was a rating system to rate buildings as far as how green or how sustainable uh, they would be. LEED is one of many different rating systems. There was the Envision rating system that came up uh, to look at infrastructure projects. And, you know, it makes sense that how you would evaluate a building would be different than how you'd evaluate a road or a transmission line or something of that nature. So Envision is looking at those different qualities for infrastructure. You know, there's green roads for transportation projects. You know, there's ones for just universities, et cetera, et cetera. So there are lots of different rating systems out there. But we're going to look at LEED specifically as one example because it's maybe the best, uh, most well-known. And then we're going to look at some of the you know, goals of it and then some of the problems associated with that. So at the heart of designing sustainable systems is rooted in the lifespan of those systems because we are going to use lots of resources to build something. And those resources will then have to be replenished and built again once that lifespan is reached. And so most of our infrastructure, if you remember, you know, back in uh, 1900, that image I showed of downtown New York, it was like horses and buggies. You know, the Model T car was 1908. 1930s was the Great Depression. Then we had World War II, sort of 30s through 40s, ended in 45. You know, right there in the sort of 40s, 50s, we had this huge industrial complex. Most of it was going towards the war effort. Then after the war, we quickly transitioned to producing lots of goods, lots of commercial goods. Um, and a lot of our infrastructure was built in that time frame. That's when we started uh, with the uh, infrastructure, the uh, interstate highway system, uh, just a lot of development, uh, a lot of uh, access to goods, to cars, to buildings, to homes, to appliances, uh, etc. And our infrastructure was initially built with these timelines in mind. They're basically, sort of 50 to 100 years uh, was the typical lifespan that was envisioned for these. This is important just because you know we've got lots of infrastructure now that have reached kind of this ideal lifespan. And so they are crumbling and need to be reinvested. And we either need to rehabilitate them or tear them down and build new. And since we find ourselves at that juncture, you know, it begs the question, how long should we design our systems for? You know, I might venture to say that you know, this 50 to 100 years, that's just like my lifespan, right? It's a typical sort of human lifespan. And so if you build a building, do we think that the building should just have the same lifespan as a person? You know, or should it last multiple generations? And if it should last multiple generations, then that means that we need to build our systems with that in mind and build them a little bit more robustly, a little bit stronger so that they'll last longer. And so from a sustainability perspective, it would be much more sustainable to build a building that would last 200 years. At some point, there's a balance, right? Technology, society changes a lot over decades. You get into centuries, it changes drastically. So it's probably not realistic to design a building or design a, a bridge with the envision, uh, with the intent that it's going to last a thousand years. But you know, I think that doing certainly better than 50, you know, uh, maybe 200 years or so, is, is a better goal to reach. So with the LEED system that's looking at building specifically, the rating system that was developed for that looks at these six different categories to award points for each category. So LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. 
and this is looking at the design on the front end for a new building. So you've got some points for sustainable sites. So where is the building located? You know, is it an infill site? Does it have access to mass transit? Is there some sort of habitat it's providing? You know, those are all ways that you can just get some points based on where you locate the building. Then you're looking at the resources the building uses during operation. So how efficient is the water use of the building? Is there any reuse system, maybe rainwater collection, harvesting, rainwater system, etc. Um, you know, water pumps and low flow uh, toilets, things of that nature that use those um, water efficiently. Energy and atmosphere, so uh, the heating, cooling, uh, you know, light use of buildings use a lot of electricity. So the systems that are designed for that, how efficient are they? Materials and resources, so what materials were selected in the construction for the building and what are the impacts, positive or negative for those. Indoor environmental quality, so that would uh, refer to you know the carpet, the tiling, the paint, uh, various finishes. That a lot of those have uh, negative compounds in them. A lot of them might have volatile organic compounds that would off gas, you know, have harmful effects to the users of that building. Um, so providing choices as far as paint and carpet and various finishes that have. Uh, fewer of those impacts, you'll get more points. And then there's a category for innovation and design. So how the building is designed, if you uh, create sort of a, uh, a non-standard or use a non-standard design approach that has some positive uh, impacts or wanting to encourage innovation, encourage new practices, new ways of doing things, so you can get points that way. So that was kind of a, the initial framework that came up. You know, buildings are important because you know they use a lot of resources, a lot of electrical use, a lot, a lot of resources going into that construction, uh, a lot of consumption of materials. So they're heavy consumers of energy use and materials. And so if we could find a rating system and encourage more sustainable practices within that, it would have a positive impact for the environment. So that was kind of the goal. That was the vision with LEED. Um, you know, with LEED, looking at just sort of energy use as far as how that breaks down. You know, buildings use it a lot, uh, roughly sort of split evenly between residential and commercial buildings. If you look at the breakdown between residential and commercial, it varies a little bit. Um, the heaviest one being the heating and cooling system, uh, lighting is a big player for each, and then you know, the commercial ones are a little heavier on computers and other systems versus the uh, residential one are a little bit uh, heavier on some of the um, uh, water heating and things of that nature. But so Recognizing that's where the energy use comes from, you know, you're going to get points from the lead system for having a more efficient heating cooling system, having, you know, LED and uh, maybe having a lot of daylighting where you've got good access to, to windows in your building so you don't have to use overhead lights as much. Things of that nature would all be uh, beneficial to get you points in the lead rating system. So that was sort of the goal, um, you know, with the rating system and with lead in general. Pan here. Uh, what would you guess that the average lead building would beat the national average as far as energy use? So how much more efficient would it be? So 10% gain, 10% less energy. 30% less energy, 50% or 75%. So this is kind of the goal, like how high do you think they set those thresholds for lead with this rating system? How many people would guess 10%? How many people would guess 30%? How many people would guess 50%? Anyone guess 75%? 
So it's kind of all across the board there, right? So the lead system is based on a series of tiers as far as points. And the average lead system uh, falls roughly in 25 to 30% better than the national average. So what that really means for the national average, you know, you've got some sort of bell curve as far as energy use. And so right here in the middle, that's our national average. And then we have lead buildings is a smaller component of that. You know, that we've got some bell curve there for our lead system. You know, that was 20 to 30% better there. But in many ways, all that it really was doing was this was kind of the existing practices within industry. And already within industry, we had buildings that were better than others. You know, that had better, more expensive heating and cooling systems that were more efficient, that saved the owner dollars over the lifespan because they used less energy, etc. And Lead just provided a recognition that if you're doing a little bit better than average, but it wasn't, in my opinion, really revolutionary where it really was pushing the envelope and really driving much more sustainable practices. It was providing a recognition for, hey, are you better than average? And how much better than average? And so, you know, if you were uh, certified, certified you were just on this lower here as far as the improvement for the lead and so it might just be roughly you know one or two percent better than national average if you were in the silver, silver or gold that's probably where most were sort of falling then that's where you were in this sort of 20 uh, 25 percent better than average and then if you're in the platinum you know, then that's when you're more on this upper tail end but that might be more su substantial about 50 percent better than average but it wasn't truly revolutionary. It wasn't really setting really high goals. So that was one of the problems, I think, with, with LEED, is that they wanted to kind of uh, encourage practices, but they didn't want to set the bar too high, because they thought if they set it too high, that might you know, just discourage people for adopting um, you know, these goals and uh, adopting this system. And so they kind of came up with this compromise. And you know, I guess it just sort of depends on how significant you think the sustainable environmental situation is and how aggressively we need to try and make more sustainable systems. If you think we can sort of operate in our sort of status quo and sort of make marginal improvements year after year, you know, maybe in 50 years we get to a sustainable state. Well, then maybe this is a, a good approach. But if you think that you know today's the day and we need to start, you know, day one being more sustainable now, this isn't going to get us there because it's very incremental. So that's been some of the problems with it. Um, this year, this is the, the checklist as far as points for the uh, PSU engineering building when it was built back in 2006. So it's a LEED gold certified building. And you can see going through here that you've got those six different categories uh, that were listed. And then, you know, if you met the requirements for each one of these for the check boxes, you would sort of get a series of points. And, you know, one of the challenges with this is that like for the gold level, you know, the gold level sort of falls between 39 to 51 points. Platinum doesn't kick in until 52, and so it ended up becoming a bit of a game system based on the owner that you know, the owner would be like, okay, I want some sort of lead certification. I think it'll be good sort of PR uh, for my building. Maybe the owner, like Portland State, that's important to them. They want um, to have a lead building. And you know, then they say, okay, well, we can get you 39 points for gold. You know, it's going to cost this amount. If we want to sort of shoot for platinum, it's going to be this extra premium. 
And you know, the extra premium for platinum was substantial. It definitely was a lot more. And if the owner knew they didn't want to pay that extra premium, there sort of wasn't any incentive to get more than 39 points you know, to make more sustainable choices. And so it kind of uh, just became a bit of a, a points game and a, a checklist to go through. And, and in some ways in that process, you lose a little bit of the goal. You know that you're really analyzing each decision with a sustainability lens and really trying to do what's right for the environment. So, looking at some of our choices as engineers and what how we can influence things. So, for green buildings, one of the biggest ones that we have influence on is the materials. And so, generally speaking, the more material, more sustainable materials. Uh, wood be wood, they're more regenerative. And specifically with wood, you know, if we can uh, select wood that is FSC certified, so the Forestry Stewardship Council, um, they look at various logging practices and logging practices that, is, that are done in a sustainable way. Um, that wood that's harvested from that forest is sort of stamped FSC. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the, the most sustainable there. With wood and, and with, you know, if you're looking for FSC certified wood, generally speaking, you will pay a little bit more, but often it's not too substantial. So this is an article from uh, Sustainable Northwest. And, you know, often the sustainable plywoods that you can buy here are same price or perhaps even cheaper than other plywood choices. And then for other FSC uh, grade wood, like two by fours, two by six, typical framing sizes, you know, they sort of fall in the sort of 10 to 20% more than just your generic two by four you'd be buying at Home Depot. And so it's not too substantial. And in particular, I want to uh, sort of emphasize here that typically these uh, sort of framework elements for a building are one of the smaller costs for a total building. Like for a, to for a typical building like this, uh, where we've got um, a lot of partition walls, you know, this is not a structural wall, this is just a partition wall dividing different rooms. Um, so those partition walls cost a lot, the paint, the plywood, um, you know, the various finishes as far as carpet and lighting, the heating and cooling, those are huge drivers and huge cost elements for a building. And those are kind of driven by other disciplines, more architects, mechanical engineers, things of that, that nature. On the building side, as far as civil engineers, our role, we're, we're designing the, the structural systems, the framework that's holding that building up. And so that's where we'd be driving and choosing you know, the two by fours, two by sixes, et cetera. And often that structural component of a building might only account for 10% of the total building cost. And so then if you're saying, oh, well, if you're paying 10% more of something that's 10% of the total cost, it's actually only increasing the total project cost by 1%. And so it's not free, but you know, again, I think that if we frame decisions appropriately and advocate, usually the owner has the ability to pay 1% more. That's not going to be a cost breaker for a project. And so we just need to advocate for these solutions and push for them um, because they really do make a difference. Here in uh, our sector, has anyone heard of uh, like the, the new airport project and the new roof sort of going in there? Does anyone sort of follow that project a little bit? So there's a, a big movement that uh, Portland's kind of in the center of with sustainable wood construction. And one of the cool advances with that is that some of the technology that's being used in wood today uh, we can get really large spans with wood that, you know, 50 years ago we could only get with steel, steel or concrete. And often, from an architectural standpoint, we like 
really long spans because it get, makes the spaces nice and it's flexible in that there's not a lot of structural supports between them. Um, but before, for wood systems, often we couldn't accomplish those long spans, but with some of the um, cross laminated timbers and advances uh, that have been made in the last uh, couple decades, we can. And there's a big movement here uh, in uh, sort of the Northwest to do that, and the airport's one of those examples. So wood would generally be the, the most sustainable choice for buildings. Uh, concrete's used quite a bit. And sometimes concrete can get uh, a bit of a bad name as far as carbon footprint. So what would you guess the concrete industry accounts for in global worldwide CO2 emissions? Would you guess it's 1%, 5%, 10%, or 25%? How many people would guess 1%? 5%? 10%? 25%? 25%? Okay. Uh, so the correct answer is uh, 5%. So 5% roughly plus or minus of global CO2 emissions comes from concrete. If we delve a little bit deeper to sort of understand where that comes from, first thing is to understand, well, what goes into concrete? So concrete is made of kind of these five materials. Uh, the biggest one as far as impact is the cement. So cement is the limestone that you mine out and then you heat up at very high temperatures to form cement, which ends up being the glue that holds the concrete together. The other materials, and that cement typically only is roughly 10% per weight of the total concrete. The other materials are sand, gravel, water, and air. And so sand, gravel, water, and air, those are readily available. Usually they're locally sourced right near the project site, um, so low sort of transportation costs and stuff. And so most of the materials in there are you know, pretty, pretty sustainable selections. It's just kind of the cement that is that driver. And it's that cement largely because of the high temperature you have to heat it to for that chemical reaction to go uh, undergo. And so um, in that process, there is a chemical release of CO2 that happens, as well as all the energy that's needed to heat something to 1,500 degrees. Um, so there's just a lot of energy source that way. So that's um, where the energy source goes in and uh, that largely impacts that CO2 footprint. But the reason why it's 5% is largely because we just use so much of it. So this graph, what it shows, uh, the green line at the top is the biomass line. So biomass is all the living material on the earth. And so this is in uh, tetratons. So I think there's 1.2 tetratons of biomass on the earth. And so you look Here's at, uh, you look at uh, the, the graph here, um, and you know, early human civilization, obviously we hadn't produced much uh, mass of other things than as the Industrial Revolution and uh, the war effort, we had all these industries started really sort of producing things. We started producing a lot of materials um, and now we've actually produced more materials than there is living biomass on the earth. And the largest component of that is this purple component down here that is concrete. And so the two largest by far is concrete. The next blue one here is gravel. So the biggest impact as far as why concrete has a large global uh, carbon footprint is just we use so much of it. We produce so much and continue to produce so much year after year that it's gonna have a big impact. So where do we use concrete? 
So this chart here comes from the U.S. where concrete is used. So roughly 30% streets and highways, 20% residential buildings, commercial buildings, public buildings, We've got farm construction, and then here's like some other sort of utilities and uses for it. So, oh, you know, three quarters of the graph here is roads and buildings, where we use concrete. So this is specific to the U.S. Other countries would be a little different, but still, those would be the, the large uses for concrete. And then if you look on the global scale, what countries are using and producing uh, the most uh, concrete? The yeah, U.S. is actually relatively small, down here only a few percent. Most of the world's concrete production is in China, which is massive growth, massive population there. Uh, and you see the mix of the rest. But so for as far as an industry here in the US, like you know, the US concrete industry is is not that big of a player. But you know, in China there's so much production, so much expansion of uh, urbanization. Most of the urbanization, they had to, you know, provide living living buildings, streets, infrastructure to support uh, that massive population growth in the urban centers, and that largely was done uh, by concrete construction. And the fossil fuel source to power that in China is largely coal-powered power plants, so high carbon footprint for that. Like I just really interesting to kind of look at the um, you know, different consumption rates on a per capita basis as far as that goes. So that's kind of the discussion as far as the concrete element because uh, it's not uh, quite cut and dry. You know, the, the biggest contributors there, you know, as far as understanding why concrete has a big uh, footprint. First one is just we use so much of it for our infrastructure, and you know, looking at the the various uses uh, for your uh, uses, you know, for the, the streets and the highways, you know, often there's not a good alternative right now. Like when we were talking about the material choices before, as far as like, well, what's more sustainable? You know, well, wood you can use in buildings. We're not going to use wood to design our roads. Um, and, you know, we have such a large inventory of infrastructure that, you know, in many ways we don't have the forest to replace all our building construction with just uh, wood construction, we, we just don't have enough trees for that too. So, any questions about that concrete component? So one of the cool things we can do with concrete, so if you remember from one of the previous slides, uh, only about 10% of the concrete actually is the cement. And that cement is the component that has the high carbon footprint. Well, you actually can use less cement by substituting instead of cement different waste products. So one of the common ones, flash or slag, it's a, a byproduct or a waste product from steel manufacturing that instead of using 10% cement, you could use 5% cement and 5% fly ash. And in many ways, you don't have any negative impacts. The concrete still works pretty well. You have just about the same strength of the concrete. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a good sort of one-for-one -one substitute. Um, so there are different ways to do that. Another exciting thing that they're looking at doing in concrete is there's some carbon sequestration practices looking at going into this where we actually harvest CO2 from the atmosphere and then you know that air that is embedded in the concrete, air was one of those components that used to make concrete and air particles get trapped in the concrete. That if we, um, instead of using just generic air, we use specifically CO2 air that we harvest from the environment, we can then embed and capture that CO2 in the concrete. Um, and so it's a emerging technology, emerging field to sequester it that way.
So all this is sort of rooted in this discussion as far as the, the lead system. And, you know, it had some benefits, but it didn't push the envelope too significantly. And, you know, some of the problems that we had, one of them on the site selection, where we are trying to identify, hey, let's reward some points based on where you site the building. You know, in principle, that's good. But one of the realities of the lead system is that it doesn't look at geographic differences. And so it doesn't look at like, oh, well, let's say you're in Phoenix, a desert where you don't have good access to water. So prioritizing water conservation would be more important in that environment than somewhere like Portland where we get lots of rain. Another big uh, critique is that the lead system is just a checklist that you go through during the de design construction phase. And then once the building is built, it's done. So there's no follow-up looking at, okay, you installed this more efficient you know, lighting system or a more efficient heating and cooling system, but it doesn't look at how the owner uses those systems and maintains those systems over the lifespan because there certainly are more uh, sustainable ways to use those and encouraging you know, less energy use of, of residents and tenants and stuff. And so that's a big, uh, a big complaint. Being the point game that I mentioned before, you can sort of manipulate things to get you to that threshold that the owner wants. And you know, not all points are created equal. So you might get a, a point for a, a cheap little bike rack because it's promoting sustainable and alternative transportation to the site. Um, but you know, the really expensive HVAC system, you know, would cost much more and have much more significant impact, but you don't get a lot more points for making that choice. So because of these systems and because of some of the frustration within the building industry, you know, there was a, a movement of practitioners that said, hey, this, this isn't revolutionary enough. We need to rethink this and not rethink it on a small scale, but rethink it on a real significant scale. And so that's where the idea of the living building challenge came from. And the idea with it was that basically our built buildings before had huge negative impacts. And with the lead system, we just were making marginal reductions in that negative impact but they still had negative impacts. There was a net negative loss for building it, for doing the project. And the idea with the living building challenge is what if we could have no negative impacts and actually have a net good? Do you look at energy use? Well, what if we set the expectation that not only does the building have to efficiently use energy, but produce more energy than it uses? You know, what if instead of looking at just the uh, water use of the building, what if the building actually has to have a closed loop water system where it recycles and re harvests its water so that it's really regenerative? What if they've got to grow their own food and all sorts of things? And so that really was the vision with the living building challenge where a group of practitioners got together and really wanted to revolutionize the industry. And at first, it was just an aspirational goal. Is this possible? Can we do this? And then with the Bullet Center, it was the first building built to meet the challenge of the living, build, uh, living building challenge. Bullet Center's in uh, Seattle. It opened uh, 10 years ago, April 22nd, 2013. And I've got a, got a video here talking about the Bullet Center. Before skyscrapers, Seattle's waterfront had a little more like tide flats and evergreen forests. When there was a Douglas fir forest there, it ran off of the sunlight that fell on it, it used the water that fell on it. It was beautiful and it did nothing that polluted the building of day. 
What if urban landscapes like this could return to our natural states? That's what the Seattle-based Bullet Foundation is trying to do in creating the world's greenest office building. We're taking a piece of land that was, was basically a ramshackle bar and we're turning it into something that has the characteristics of the Douglas fir forest that was there before. It is a building that is in complete balance with nature. The six-story Bullet Center is part of a growing effort to meet the living building challenge, the world's most rigorous standard in sustainable building. It requires a structure to generate all its own energy, harvest its own water, and deal with all its own waste on site. The foundation decided that we really wanted to walk our talk. We've been preaching this stuff for the last two decades. Uh, now we're going to show that, that not only that it can be done, but that we will do it. They hoped to design a building that was so elegant and energy efficient that it would inspire builders around the world. But first, it had to be built using only locally sourced, non-toxic materials. It was Joe David's job to screen out more than 350 toxic chemicals. square foot building, it's all commercial office. Yeah, you can take anything. How about uh, like this concrete column right here? So we know that all the stone that's in this concrete comes from about 30 miles away. It was surprising how often you come across a product that um, you know, may have some toxic component, but it was just being used because it was um, industry standard. We may be the first office building in the world to be essentially toxic free. All of the wood in the building, and there is a lot of wood in this building, is, is certified to meet the highest international standards of forestry. We can go back basically pallet by pallet and figure out what forest the wood was extracted from, where it was processed. On top of the building, they're counting on a sprawling array of solar panels to generate 230,000 kilowatt hours a year, hopefully just enough for the building to break even. If you can build it in Seattle and make it work, then there is certainly no excuse to build it in any place in the southern two-thirds of the United States where they actually have some sunlight. To run a 50,000 square foot building off the sunlight that falls on it, the structure has to be super efficient. Tenants in the building are going to have an incredible access to daylight. Given our energy constraints, we went back to uh, using daylight to, to light the spaces. The bullet center is at least 80% more efficient than most of the high rise commercial office buildings in Seattle and is operating at least twice as efficiently as really the best, greenest, current, comparable. Class A office buildings in Seattle. And yet we'll still have ample lighting, our computers will work, our refrigerators will keep our food cold. We're just, we're not sacrificing any services. We're just doing it vastly more efficiently. Hayes wants this level of efficiency to become an industry standard. If you took just the office buildings in the United States today and reduce their energy consumption by half, you would be saving twice as much energy every year as America imports from the Middle East. The solar panels will also funnel rainwater into a 56,000 gallon system. There, it will be filtered until it's clean enough to drink. And how will they deal with the human waste in the building? By using the world's first six story composting toilet system. Unlike other green buildings, Living buildings must prove their environmental credits for a full year. That means each of the building's tenants will follow a strict water and energy budget. Robert Pena and his team from the University of Washington's Integrated Design Lab are some of the first occupants. This is an opportunity to really be in a living laboratory where we can really poke and prod the building's vital signs. We don't think that we'll see any difference in our working lifestyle. One notable difference will be the price. The $18.5 million center runs about $355 a square foot in construction costs. That's $55 more per square foot than a typical commercial building. Well, we bang a little bit more for a living building for the, uh, uh, the fact that we want it to last 250 years. Uh, but we think that's the way that the economy ought to be organized. We want to build things that will endure, something that will become part of the, the quasi-permanent wealth of society.
Not something to put up and then break down a few years later and haul off the dump and build another one. Fundamentally, this building is about making healthier communities. I think sometimes we forget that the biggest cost of doing business is, is the people who are working in that building and not the real estate. And if this building can demonstrate that it really is uh, a happier, healthier, more productive place to work, then all of these questions about um, energy, water, even real estate costs, I think become a whole lot less important. It's impossible to say that something is impossible if, if it exists. And I wanted to get something that was concrete out there, that was functioning, that would serve as an example. Because once you do something, then it becomes thinkable for everybody else to do it. I would love people to remember the, the Bullet Center as a bold pioneering effort that showed to what could be done and was at the vanguard of a revolution in building technologies. And at the same time, I would really like 20 years from now to have buildings that are better than this one and for people to come to it and say, what was all the fuss about? It looks like all the other cool ones. So uh, some of the things I want to highlight there uh, before we leave. So looking at the energy use, your average building score here, 72 kilobytes per square foot per year. Um, here you've got the lead platinum. So the highest threshold as far as the lead platinum would be at 32. And the bullet center is right here at 16. So it's more than twice as good as the lead platinum and 83% better than the sort of average building there. So much more aggressive, really pushing the envelope there as far as um, how, how big the improvements were. And you know, for this aggressive improvement, it makes sense that it's gonna cost more, but this is the first building ever produced to meet these challenges. And did anyone hear how much more it cost? It costs 355 per square foot compared to 300 per square foot. That's 17% more. So 17% more for the first, first one ever produced. Like if you start building more and more, you know, economies of scale, you produce a second, you produce a third, you know, those costs start to come down because there, if there's demand for products, demand for services, demand for, uh, you know, various design features, we, we get more efficient in how we do things. So I thought that was um, pretty pretty amazing that it was only 17% more um, to be this aggressive, be substantial as far as improvements. Looking here as far as where those energy savings come from, um, you know, there are your different sort of pie charts there. And so 10 years ago, this was the first one, but there have been, been Quite a few buildings that have also met that challenge. Uh, here's a little graph you can kind of look at. As far as the, the geothermal wells they utilize to help sort of reduce heating, cooling in the system and the building, these radiant four systems. But here locally, the PAE, PAE is a mechanical HVAC uh, mechanical engineering company um, headquartered here in Portland. They built their sort of flagship office building here on the inner east side. Uh, it was opened uh, a few years ago, and it um, exceeds the standards of the Bullet Center. So it meets the living building challenge and is more efficient than the Bullet Center. And looking at some of the choices here, so this is included in the reading uh, for the week that you can sort of read through there and uh, see that. But uh, one of the challenges they had here is that in order to, uh, you know, there's a $40 million structure and in order to um, make it profitable to offset the increased cost, like they needed to make it a stiffer building, um, and so it's going to increase the cost by $135,000 of the $40 million price tag, and they offset that cost by simply reducing the uh, seismic joint between the buildings. So they reduced it by four inches, which increased the overall square footage of the building marginally each floor, 
but that small marginal increase increased the total building square footage so then they could rent it more for for tenants um, so it's kind of a unique interesting solution and on a uh, yeah I think uh, just want to highlight there that it's more efficient um, than the bull center so any questions yeah Uh, yeah, I mean, so the Bullis Center here, I don't know if you caught that piece too, it was designed with a 250 year lifespan um, sort of goal, and so it's more robust. And often, you know, to make a you know, design a structural system to be more robust, it's not like you're doubling the strength, doubling the size of the material. Often it might be like a 20% more strong to give it that additional strength, that additional resilience to last twice as long. And again, so it's kind of just a, a marginal increase there. But I think that, um, you know, our current infrastructure is a case in point that we built so much infrastructure post-World War II and we can see before our eyes that it's crumbling and needs to be replaced. And if you're going to build something, build it to last. You know, it just makes so much more just common sense, I think. That if you kind of can frame frame the the discussion that way, and and instead of building it with a shorter lifespan and then redoing it later, you're going to have twice the cost and all the sort of impacts to society as those uh, that infrastructure is rebuilt versus build you know perhaps paying 17 to 20 percent more the first time, but then having it last you know twice as long. It's just in everybody's interest I think but we you know we've got to frame it that way and, and you know some of our uh, our systems are set up where you know building developer they just want to sort of turn a profit and sell it and they're not the ones that are operating the building over the life cycle so if they're not the ones operating it over the life cycle some of those more expensive costs as far as like the heating and cooling if you invest in more sustainable heating and cooling on the front end you actually save money over the long term because you use less energy year after year to heat and cool it. And so you save money over the life cycle of the building. But if the incentives and the finances are all sort of um, set up just on the front end where the developer just wants to sort of sell it and get rid of it and then not use it, um, you know, we've got to sort of tweak that a little bit and maybe think of a, a marketplace um, that we can um, incentivize um, you know, some of those more sustainable choices. Cool. Well, I think we're out of time, so I'll leave you there, and we'll talk about licensure on Wednesday. Thank you.